Well, I wanted to thank everyone for doing fantastic singing this while. Well, amazing. Great. Thank you so much, Sebastian and Meg. And, uh, yeah. It's awesome. Well, this is our new facility. If you're, you, some of you are new here, some of you were here last week, but this is our new worship building. And, uh, now, Lewis has already made himself comfortable. He found the best, one of the best seats in the house back there. Uh, he's out there just back there, just kicking it. Um, and it's this is something that God has blessed us with. And I shared the story last week uh, how God uh, on that Monday, Karen and I were taking a Sabbath, and then lo and behold, we met a sister. She poured out her heart. I had ruined Sabbath that morning. And, uh, Karen was upset with me. I was trying to recover the relationship. And we had a cup of coffee. A sister was there. Two hour conversation. I thought I was a dead man. And then, uh, after it was over, Karen was like, that was encouraging. So she got a call from uh, the minister who, who rents this facility. And he said, why, why don't you come take a look at it? And we did. And this is what we have. So it's awesome. 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 Yeah, to be here. Um, I'm going to ask you to keep in your prayers, Nick Black. The, and we, we, last night, we, a bunch of married people came over to my house. And when married people get together, it's kind of a ruckus. <laughs> yeah. Trying to live, live, well, live, live in their past. It's a ruckus. You know, it's amazing. It's fun. It's a great time. And uh, in the evening, ended beautifully, but Nick had, had started to get stomach pains. And uh, so he's in the, actually he's in the hospital. He had to go to ER and spent most of the night in the hospital. Is a stomach condition he's had since he was a child. Mm -hmm. So I just pray for him. Uh, obviously, Chin was exhausted and being up all night. Yeah. Thank God they have grandma with the kids, but uh, it's a tough situation. So I'll be praying for Nick. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, um, you know, just be praying for our hearts this morning. Just to kind of, when you come to church, try to absorb what God is trying to Try to figure out what God, what is God leading you to? What is he showing you? What is he bringing you to? And I'm doing a series on discipleship. And if you've been here with us a couple of weeks, we're just studying out what it means to be not just a church attender, but a, a real disciple. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce to you the story of Simon and how he became a disciple. Because Jesus can change us. Simon was a fisherman, and he's having a bad morning. He knows who Jesus is. He's, he's seen Jesus. His relatives have seen Jesus. He's interacted with Jesus. You know, his brother Simon and Andrew and James and John. And they're back from this trip, and they're and they were, they were trying to catch fish. And our team ministry can go ahead and go into the uh, into the room if you'd like, or you can stay here. It's up to you guys. But um, Ryan Figueroa is our great team leader on Sunday. Thank you, Ryan. Hey, yeah. Um, and so we're going to look at this, look at this account in Luke chapter five. And they're out all night. Simon's there, and there's a lot of fishing going on, and they need to catch fish because it's. It's their livelihood, and that's how they make money, but they catch absolutely zero fish, nothing, nada. They weren't fishing for fun. They were fishing for their livelihood, and normally he likes to talk, but he's not talking too much this morning. This morning, Simon is scrubbing his nets by talking to himself, and then he off in the distance, he hears voices. Oh, oh, man, the there's Jesus. With a bunch of people. Jesus usually has a bunch of people. And Simon's just trying to get his nets washed up and together because he's probably thinking, I'm going to go get some rest. Then I'm going to come back tonight and I'm going to go fish and, and make some money because I need to make money to feed my family. And then Jesus pulls up and he goes, Hey, Peter, do you mind if I sit in your boat? And Peter goes, oh. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> and so Jesus gets on the boat because it's kind of like an amphitheater because he's got a lot of people and standing on the boat gives him a little better way to communicate to a larger crowd. Now, if you let Jesus get close to you, because Peter was a fisherman, and he was a rough, rough guy. This is what he did. This is what he was doing. And so Jesus gets on this boat. When it's on shore, he cleans his nets. He does all the things he has to do because he's going to go back out. He wants to get some sleep. He's super tired. And when you're tired, you're a little grumpy. You're, little, you're not in the best of moods. You're not firing on all cylinders. That's where Simon was at. And Jesus comes along and says, hey, Simon, can I get in your boat? And you're like, oh, yeah, fine. Go ahead. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. So if you let Jesus get close to you, he can annoy you. <laughs> Because he's annoying Peter. It's annoying. He gets into the boat, the one belonging to Simon, and he asks Simon to put it out into deep water. I mean, Jesus is amazing. But he's been like, I've been here all night, Jesus. 
I've been here all night fishing and I haven't caught anything. And Jesus wants him to take the boat out now. Now that he's done preaching, he wants him to take the boat out into the deeper waters. He said, let's go do some fishing, Peter. I feel like fishing. And Peter is exhausted and he's probably annoyed. And Jesus tells him this. Let's go out there. And you know what Simon's thinking? Number one, it's daytime. The fish aren't in the deep. They're not out there. They're actually in the shallow. I mean, do you even know how to fish, Jesus? I mean, I'm a fisherman. This is my turf. This is my arena. This is my domain. You belong in church, Jesus. You belong in the synagogue. This is my turf. That's what he's thinking in that little thought bubble. But let's look at what he actually says. Master, um, we've worked all hard all night, and uh, we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'll let down my nets. I mean, you can almost see like the, I'm exhausted. This is not going to work. I'm the fisherman. You're the preacher. Because if you let Jesus get close, he annoys us. Because he'll, he'll, he'll ask you to do things that you're unwilling to do. And that can be annoying. Jesus isn't the fisherman. He's just pretending to know more than Simon <laughs> on his turf. Now imagine after service, if I ask you for a ride, can you give me a ride? And you're like, sure, Jim, I'll give you a ride. And we go downstairs, I'm by your car, and you get in, I get in on the passenger side. And you're, and you're like, hey, so Gio, where are we going? I'm like smiling at you. <laughs> and you're like, that's odd. So Gio, where are we going? You start leaving the parking lot. So Gio what, Gio, what can I take you? And then next thing you notice, I'm not sitting in the passenger seat. I'm kind of in the console now. <laughs> and right next to your shoulder. Yeah. And I'm still smiling at you. And you're like, Gio, uh, uh, is there, you know, and then you try to turn on the radio. And then I, then I grab the steering wheel with my left hand. And you're like, whoa, Gio, this is really uncomfortable. And then I start to grab the steering wheel with my right hand. And then I start turning the car the way I want it to go. And you're like, Gio, stop. This is my car. You are creeping me out. Stop, Gio. And that smile reminds me of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need your help. Or imagine, let's say, after church, you invite me to go golfing. I'm like, I like that golf too. I'll golf with you. And you're teeing up on the tee. You're taking your little practice swings. And you, and you, and you square up to the ball. And then you feel me come from behind and grab you <laughs> and grab the club. <laughs> and I'm going I'm to where you're going to swing this. And you're like, Gio, stop. This is weird and gross, right? <laughs> or maybe you invite me to your house and oh, no. after church and we, you know, we're hanging out and you, and, I, and you go, hey, Gio, want to watch some TV? I said, sure, I'll watch some TV with you. And you grab your remote. And as soon as you grab it, I snatch it out of your hand. I start going, tuk, 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 tuk. like, Gio, it's my remote. It's my house. What are you doing? Don't grab my remote. This is my remote. This is my golf club. This is my car. Geo, you belong in church. Stay there. And if I ever behave that way, that's exactly what you should tell me. <laughs> oh, the, here's the problem. Here's the problem. That's exactly what you end up telling Jesus. This is my remote. Jesus, don't tell me what I should and shouldn't watch. This is my car, Jesus. Don't tell me how to drive. This is my checkbook, Jesus. Don't tell me how to spend my money. Hey, Jesus, this is my free time. I can do what I want in my free time. Leave me alone. I'm doing fine. Jesus, you belong in the synagogue. Stay there. We let him get close. Jesus can annoy us. Because he wouldn't know about my finances. He wouldn't know about how I do my friendships. He doesn't know anything about the movies I watch. He doesn't know about the business I conduct. He doesn't know what I'm like at work or what I'm like at school or, or what I'm like around people. He wouldn't know how to run my life. I know how to run my life. In fact, I've always lived like that. I've always talked this way. I've always done my work like that. I've always said those kind of jokes. I've always had this kind of attitude and I've always gotten this kind, gone these kinds of websites. I know how to run my life. After all, Jesus, I've been doing this a long time. I'm the fisherman, Simon says. You're not the fisherman. This is my turf. Your turf is church. This is my domain. So if we let him get close, he'll annoy us. And so 
if we respond to Jesus' annoyance and if we let him a little closer, we start to feel like Jesus, hey, I really don't need you. I don't need you in my life. Because if we let Jesus closer, not only does he know, annoy us, he scares us. Simon lets down his net. And all the while knowing it's not going to work, and yet he does it. He lets down his net, even though he was, why are we in the deep waters? The fish are in the shallows. And they catch such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. If we let Jesus get close, he annoys us. But if we let Jesus get, get closer, <laughs> wow, he really does fish. Fish. I'm all right. Jesus. God doesn't know how to do relationships. I'm the jerk a lot of the times. Jesus knows what he's talking about when he says, treat others the way you want to be treated. He really does know how to do relationships. As you and I read through the teachings of Jesus, you realize he really does know how to handle money. He's the one who knows about friendships. He knows about marriage. He knows about anxiety. He knows about the purpose of life. I'm the one who doesn't know what I'm doing. Because when Jesus gets close enough to you, it scares you. Simon's no longer annoyed. He feels something else. He says, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. Now be scared. He's scared of Jesus. He knows what Jesus is capable of. He goes, Get away from me, Jesus. He's scared. He's, he's no longer saying, Jesus, I don't need you. He's saying, Jesus, you don't need me. I'm too sinful. I'm a sinful man. Where are you with Jesus? Where are you with Jesus? Does he annoy you? I mean, he's always trying to run your life, right? <laughs> and I run my life just fine. You can run my life on Sunday, Jesus. Because I'm going to your church. I'm going to where your turf is. But on Monday, keep your hands off me, right? Keep your hands off my steering wheel, my golf gloves, my remote, my checkbook. Leave it alone. I run my life just fine, thank you. I, I don't really need them. Or does Jesus scare you? Maybe we've outgrown that adolescent ignorance of, you know, to where you started to see Jesus as he really is. And it sort of starts to sober us up. Like, wow, maybe, maybe he really does know. You're no longer annoyed. You're scared because you know just what he's capable of. And you know you're not fit. Because you're like, I'm so sinful. How can I ever be one of his disciples? Away from me. Lord, I'm a sinful man. You can't, you don't want to be around me. I failed as a disciple. I'm a failure. You don't want me. I've been sinning way too much. And a lot of people find themselves right there. They're afraid to follow Jesus. And they're convinced that Jesus doesn't need them or want them. And this is such a problem. Because if we stay there, we have an unfinished story. Imagine if Simon, in the state of saying, away from me, I'm a sinner, and that's where the story ends. Simon's story is over. Imagine that. Or imagine when God came to Moses, and he goes, hey, I need you to go to Pharaoh and tell my people go. He goes, well, I have a stuttering problem. Imagine if the story ended right there. Or imagine if, when God came to Mary, he goes, hey, I, I, I'm wanting you to, to give birth to the Son of God, the deity. He says, I'm, I'm a virgin. I can't do that. And their story ends there. Why are we imagining this? Because a lot of us are living this way. Mm. Our story's on pause. And we pause on this moment where we feel like, hey, you don't need me. I'm a sinner. Pause. And they can stay paused for decades. For a long time, you can hit the pause button. Well, you know what? I'm going to hit pause and just be a church attendant. Jesus can have me on a Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, I do what I want. I don't need Jesus then. I don't want Jesus. And that's why we're imagining this. 
well, I'm not very good at reading my Bible, so I can't do children's ministry. We pause on that attitude for decades. And Isabel's like, well, you don't pause. <laughs> I know what the Bible says about this habit, but I don't think I can give it up. We pause on that attitude for decades. I know the Bible says to forgive and reconcile, but that sounds really hard, and it wasn't my fault to begin with, and honestly, it takes a lot of energy, and I don't feel like doing it, and we pause on that attitude for decades. I know Jesus calls us to make disciples, but I don't think I'm very good at it. Plus, it'll take a lot of time. I don't have. I'm a sinful person, and we pause on that attitude for decades. Mm. Away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. And so Simon doesn't end up walking on water. He doesn't give the great confession. Who do people say? Yeah, you are the son of God. He doesn't get to do that. He doesn't get to preach at Pentecost and, and, and his, his first sermon delivered. He doesn't get to do that. He doesn't talk to Cornelius, the first Gentile convert to Christianity. He doesn't go to Rome and share the gospel. Peter just tells Jesus, you can use my boat. But he never tells Jesus, you can use me. Mm -hmm. End of story. Done. That's why the story fascinates me. Because Simon's a lot like us. We know we're sinful, and we hit that pause button, and we just set it on pause, thinking, God can't use me. Yeah, he, he annoyed me at first, but now he scares me. He doesn't want me. He doesn't need me. You know, if, you, if you're old enough to remember the, the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, if you, it comes on every Christmas. I love it. They're phasing it out, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an oldie but a goodie. So if you're 50 years or older, you're like, I know that movie. And in that movie, George Bailey is at the end of his rope financially, and he wishes he was never born. And so God sends a secondary angel named Clarence to him. And he's, Clarence is trying to get his wings back, so he's trying to be helpful. <laughs> and so Clarence shows him that what it would be like if he was never born. And George kneels by the great stone of his little brother, his little brother Harry. He's like, look at your brother Harry, says the angel. He broke through the ice and was drowned at age nine. And George goes, that's a lie. That's a lie. Harry went to war. He saved all those lives on that transport. And, and Clarence goes, every man on that transport died. Harry wasn't there to save them because you weren't there to save Harry. Mm. And then, wow. It's a moment for George. Why is it that more people aren't disciples of Jesus? Like, why aren't there more? Why aren't more people going to heaven? You know, at least we know part of the reason more people aren't saved because the disciples are frozen in fear. We've hit the pause button. And their stories are paused. And their stories are half written. And God's got a plan for every life in this room. God's got a story that he wants to write with your life. But too many of us, we have that pen and we don't, we snatch it. We don't, we don't want, I don't want to write this because it's scary because I'm sinful. If we let Jesus get even closer to us, not only is he going to be annoyance at first and then we get scared, but look what he wants to do with us. Look what he wants to, us to become. Look what he wants us to be. He wants us to use us to make disciples of all nations. That's what he wants. And if more people would let God write their stories, more people would go to heaven. But we're afraid. We're scared. It's frightening. And we're partially right. We are sinful men. We are sinful women. Yet if we let Jesus get even closer, he uses you. Because look what he tells Peter. Don't be afraid. Because Peter is frightened. From now on, you'll fish for people. It's as if Jesus is telling Simon, look, I know you can't kick very far because you're a fisherman. I know you can't throw the ball very well because you're a fisherman. I know most people won't pick you on your team because you're always cranky. But I want you on my team. I've got the perfect place for you on my team. I need people to fish for other people. And I want you on that team. I want you on my team. This is what he's telling Peter, who, who's convinced, get away from me. I don't belong on your team. 
And instead of catching hundreds of fish, that same fisherman preaches one sermon and the Holy Spirit catches 3,000 people in one afternoon. And you know what they call this catch of 3,000 in the Bible? Mm. They call it the church. Mm. Now just imagine a church where each person in church is letting God write their story. If you want it, that to be you. If you want that to be you. If you want to say, well, I want God, I want to, my story to be like this story. Yeah, he's annoying. Tells him what to do. He can't do that. Remote, my car, my this, my that. Okay, now he scares me. Now he's really close. Now I realize, well, I'm sinful. You really know what you're doing, Jesus. You really know how to have relationships. You really know how to have a great marriage. You really know how to raise kids. You really know. And it scares you because you realize how sinful you are. But if you want him to write your story, pay attention to the very next verse. So they pulled up their boards onto the shore, left everything, and followed. That was their Simon's reaction. After being scared, he left everything, all the doubts, all the fear, all the reluctance, and followed. This is a story of Peter. He's just like you and I. He's scared because Jesus is the real deal. And Jesus wants you on his team. And he wants Simon on his team. God wants to write that story. So God wants you to un hit that pause button and unpause your life. Because some of us, we've hit that pause button and we've been sitting there maybe for years. It's time to unpause it. The pause button more. I used to be a disciple maker. Pause. Now I'm going to raise kids. Now I'm going to be married. Now I'm going to get a job. And we live that way for decades. When the whole time we can do that and make disciples. It should never be paused. It's because we're scared. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll catch people. And I will use you to write your story. Let's pray. Amen. God, thanks so much for the story of Simon. And I love God later on how you changed his name to Peter. A transformation, God, that he was, he was willing to unpause. He was willing to allow you to write his story. And man, what a story. I, I get to watch this in the, in the, in the show, the, the series Chosen, God. It's such a great great story in there it's just a fabulous depiction of jesus and his ministry and god we pray that you'll use us we pray that any heart in this room who, who's hit the pause button out of fear out of sinfulness the little unpause god and and use us to write a story that glorifies you a story that is yet to be written father take us to the places that we're scared to go but you want us to go and you tell us, don't be afraid. You're going to catch people for me. God, help us to have that heart as disciple makers. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Last week, I, um, I'm reading this book. and So you're reading the book with me and voluntarily reading this book, but hopefully I've saved your money. Uh, well, the Israelites, after the monarchy came undone and Solomon divided the, the, the the Israelites became worshipers of God, but yet they were oppressing their fellow Israelites. And I talked about a few things they were doing. They were fasting, being spiritual, going to church, playing all the symbols, but they were oppressing their brothers, right? They wouldn't pay them on time. Uh, they would not give them the seven year, each, each year of Jubilee or the reason of their debt, nothing. They just kept working them and working them and working them. And they were cruel and it was perpetual slavery. And, um, they couldn't get out of it. So I'm just going to continue on this little thread. Um, when the slaves cried out for justice, they were defeated in court by deceitful, you know, richer Israelites, right? Um, that still happens today, right? And so uh, they, they, they were forcing the Israelites to work on the Sabbath so the owners could make more money and have an have a easier life. 
Their hearts were mastered by the goal of making and protecting their money, if, even if it meant doing so, being directly disobedient to God. This is where the Israelites became. So God would send prophets to them to, hey, stop that. And then they, 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 all their fasting, they're like, oh, God, well, we're fasting. We're doing all the right things. We're doing great. And God says, look, in contrast, look, look how God describes what fasting is, what he desires. Because they're, they're, they're worshiping God, yet they're oppressing their brother. And this kind of fasting might actually cost the people some money. So look, look at the description. This God says, this is what I consider fast. That people were to loose the bonds of wickedness. And to undo the strap of the, of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. That's what God's response was to them. That the landowners had no desire or intention to free those who served them. They held them captive for their labor, as the Egyptians had done. If the owners were generous, as God had been to Israel, they would have wanted to liberate them from the servitude that resulted from their poverty. But they refused. So God says, look, if you want it really fast then let them go. It's the same cry that he told the Pharaoh, let my people go, right? And God said, it's not to share your bread with the hungry. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? I wonder if these landowners refused to open their farming enterprises to the current poor, to the homeless and naked Israelites. They could probably make more money by keeping the previous generation of slaves and their children, and never letting them go. So there was no more uh, room in the farms or in the hearts for the merciful role that indentured servanthood could play in giving the poor a way to survive and freeing them to start again. These landowners drove away gleaners and other poor who might feed themselves from the fields in accordance with the Mosaic law. Remember the story of Ruth? She was gleaning from Boaz's field, and he allowed them to, to, to do that because God said to do that. Give them, you know, give them the leftovers. It's, it's appropriate. But the Israelites were so focused on their fasting and worshiping, and they were doing this, and God goes, you got it wrong. And he would send prophets. And you know what they would do to those prophets? They would kill them because they didn't want to hear it, right? So the Israelites needed a change of heart to compel them. Pour themselves out for the hungry and satisfy the desire for the afflicted. God promised them, if you do this, then your light will rise in the darkness and your gloom will be as the noonday sun. And so the chapter ends with one of the most exalted promises in the Bible. Then you shall take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, your, your, the mouth of the Lord. If you do what's right, I will take care of you. That's what God's telling his people. If you do what's right, I'll take care of the rest. And that takes a sub substantial amount of trust. So not only am I en or encourage you, I'm trying to educate you, not just to be great givers to tithers and contributors to the church, but I want you to be known as great, generous people, where the community sees you as generous people, where your neighbors see you, sees you as a generous person. It should come out of us. You know, I got tested. I ran into some guy came to my came to my window at McDonald's. He goes, "Hey, you can I have some money." And usually, when they're that far, like I, I'm usually like, "Hey, man, get her from my car." But I was like, "Oh, the Lord, the Lord has brought this man here." So, I, and I rarely carry cash. But I, I, I was my my wife has has a little compartment. She's got a bunch of change in it. Hope I'm not messing something up. <laughs> all of it, all of it. And there it is. And I was like, "What I gave him more." So then I, then I then went over to the bank and I said, I'm going to start carrying some cash. So I carried some cash. And then I saw this, I came out of the hardware store and I saw this little girl selling these wickedly delicious cookies. I mean, wickedly delicious. And I'm like, I can't eat those anymore. So I, I said, I'm going to buy one anyway. And so I said, here, I said, how much for a box? She's like, $6. I said, I got six bucks right here. She said, She's like, which one do you like? I said, I want you to keep it. And I want you to decide to give it to someone who might need it. Remember that? And, and she's like, she didn't know how to react. She's like, oh, no. and I was like, oh, can she do that? She's like, oh, yeah, thank you so much. So keep the box and give it to someone you think might need it or be encouraged by it. And I was like, and I, and I left her going like, yes, I do that. I'm like, no, that's too many calories. I'm not interested in your weekly delicious cookies. 
You know, <laughs> or normally when a guy comes by my window, I'm like, you are too aggressive to back off, buddy. But if I'm going to teach this, God's going to say, well, you're going to have to live it. You're going to have to be ready to be a generous person. And I'm sure that wasn't going to save this man's life, the, the change I got. But it's that spirit. It's that spirit I, I'm willing to give. And that's what I, I hope to impart on you is to have that spirit. You know, we ask, you know, for, for some contribution for our children's ministry, our youth ministry, which includes our teens, our legends, and our children's ministry. And when these two brothers that says, hey, we'll go dollar for dollar. And so, and so you guys were like, let's go, right? <laughs> now, you weren't supposed to take your contribution and then put it into that pile, right? That's like... <laughs> So, you know, you, you know, you can't like not give your, your tithe, but I'm going to put it over in youth ministry. We, we we're going to count that because that's like not, you know, we don't want to, you know, be these people here, right? So we're not going to do that. So we counted the money and it was about 2787. And I called the brothers up. They're like, let's go. Each of them went dollar for dollar. Wow. So we raised $8,500. <laughs> Wow! What? I was like, wow, my kids are great. And some there's two there's two families that gave a good chunk. And I just want to, they know who they are and just want to lift them up because that is the spirit of generosity. The rest of us were just throwing in, you know, money. It was great. And I was, I was actually, I was actually encouraged and shocked, you know. And I was like, bro, is this okay, bro? You know, I felt bad. Can you still do that? Like, we got it. And so this morning I got a text like we got it. And so I just want to announce that to you that that those and that's restricted funds. So it only goes for you know activities, supplies, events, whatever would encourage that ministry, signs, all the decorative stuff that Isabel and Karen are going to work together and make that awesome. Amen. Okay. So appreciate your generosity. Let's pray for our contribution. And if you, if you want to give online, here's our here's our digital giving application. You can look at that. I'll leave it up there. God, thank you so much for um, generosity and how generous you are with us, Father. You're such a great giver. Uh, you're a great encourager. And it just feels so good to, to do what you do, to have that image of you, to, 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 to reflect that image to our neighbors, to our brothers, to our sisters, and uh, just to the people around us that when they see us, they can see the image of God, this generous a character, because you are so much like that, Father. Build in us a deepness of generosity, God, a deepness of just um, being a great giver in our community so we can really reflect your amazing character. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.